Now let's welcome today's moderator, academician Shen Zhenghu, to give you the introduction of Dr. Hansen. Let's welcome Dr. Hu. Uh, President Ong, Professor and Mrs. Hansen, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Shen Chenghu, uh, moderator for this lecture. It's my pre pleasure to introduce to you our distinguished speaker, Professor Lars Hansen. You have just seen him, uh, Nobel laureate in economic sciences, 2013 and honorary academician Academia Sinica among his many uh, distinguished titles. He is a fellow of the National Science and National Academy of Sciences, a member of American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the past president of Economic Society. Professor Hansen is uh, David Rockefeller, Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Rochester. He is widely recognized for making fundamental contributions to our understanding of how economic agents cope with changing and risky environment. He has contributed to, our, to the development of statistical methods designed to explore the interconnections between macroeconomic indicators and the assets in financial markets. These methods are widely used in empirical research in all economics. The Nobel Prize Committee particularly recognized his outstanding contribution to our understanding of whether stock prices can be predicted in a longer period of time uh, Professor Hansen is now working to develop economic, <coughs> macroeconomic methods with enhanced linkage to financial market, so as to provide us with better tools for monitoring systematic risks, something like what happened in 2008. Professor Hansen is married to Grace Chang, daughter of the late academician so, Jiang so uh, academician Chang taught at uh, the University of Rochester and uh, uh, Cornell University. While teaching there, he came back to Taiwan quite frequently. Later, he became the founding president of Taiwan Institute for Economic Research and the founding president of the Zhonghua Institution. Uh, of economic research. When he passed away in 1983, he was a chairman of Chonghua Institution of Economics Research. He together with other five other academicians, the so-called uh, six academicians, Liu Yanzi, frequently provide a major and important advice to the late Chiang Kai-shek, President Chiang Kai-shek, their advice helped the made Taiwan economy grow rapidly. Also helped us establish a tax system that is uh, modern and connected to the, the world. When Dr. Chiang uh, passed away in 1983, his friends and the students from the Jiang Zhejie Foundation in memory of his many contributions to Taiwan economic development. And uh, this lecture is co-sponsored by the foundation. Uh, Professor Chang, uh, Professor Hansen's speech is entitled Uncertainty and Valuation. Professor Hansen.
mouse, I guess. It's the color just went weird. So um, thank you, President Wong. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hu. Uh, it's my great honor to be here today at the Academia Sinica. Um, I've had a long time respect for um, this, uh, this institution. Uh, I, it's my great honor to be following my father-in-law in, in ter terms of having an, an affiliation with it. So it's, uh, this is a certainly a nice occasion for me, my, fa uh, my wife, and, uh, and, uh, and our family. Um, so today I want to talk about Research that's uh, I'm going to talk across some different research projects that have been key, that I've been keenly interested in over the last um, last few years. Um, so what I want, would like to do is uh, this research is really connected to these topics of uncertainty and valuation. My aim is to show that why it is important that uh, uncertainty be broadly conceived and why uncertainty should take a front row seat in a wide variety of economic analyses. Within my field, um, I'd say historically, uncertainty has been often treated as a second order of second order consideration, particularly in macroeconomics. And I'm uh, uh, in part motivated by the financial crisis, but certainly I've had a much longer standing interest to say why uncertainty should be much more of a front row seat. Um, the research I'm talking about today, of course, I've not done in isolation. It's, uh, I, I have great collaborators that I've benefited from. Uh, including uh, Yarda Boravica, Tom Sargent, and uh, Jose Shankman. There are two ways to accentuate the impact of uncertainty in, in economic models. Um, first, we can, by which we can accentuate it by increasing the measured exposure to uncertainty through better qu quantifying probability possibilities of extreme outcomes, and uh, and by uh, and second, also by enhancing the concern of the decision maker. And uh, both of these are potentially important, and their interaction is of keen interest. So it's a, there's kind of how much uncertainty is out there and how people respond to it. And so it's the, the connections between the two then are of, of keen interest. So to address these issues, uh, I, I'll be exploring developments in so-called decision theory and uncertainty. And this literature has uh, led, leads us to think about uncertainty in much broader terms than is typical in many economic analyses. A lot of economic analyses focus on this uh, uh, construct called risk, and uh, my aim will be to kind of think about what, what we or, or to show what we can gain by broadening that our, that perspective. Um, I find it useful to start off with a, this picture. In fact, there's two pictures put together, but it's. Uh, uh, to give us a rather substantial historical perspective on issues. So in this picture, on your left is Jacob Bernoulli, and any statisticians here, of course, will know Jacob Bernoulli's work well from the so-called Law of Large Numbers. Uh, Jacob Bernoulli was doing this work back 300 years ago, so I, we're, we're, we're certainly jumping way far back into the past. Why Jacob Bernoulli? If we look at the theory of probability prior to pre-Jacob Bernoulli, So if we look at uh, the theory of probability before Jacob Bernoulli, it was all about games of chance, uh, situations in which you, know, like, you, know, you roll the dice, you flip the coins, you know what the probabilities are, and then you can start using that knowledge to then compute probabilities of events, potentially, potentially very complicated events. But games of chance are situations where you know stuff, you know probabilities. You don't know outcomes, but you know probabilities. Uh, Jacob Bernoulli was actually interested in analyzing social scientific data um, and 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 using probability models to in that analysis. And these are situations in which you didn't know the probabilities. You had to look to the data itself to figure out the probabilities. So imagine you've got some urn, you don't know the number of balls in it between say red and blue. You the way you figure it out is you make repeated draws off that urn and you start figuring out the probabilities in those draws. Um, and, and so Jacob Bernoulli's Law of Large Numbers was a characterization of how quickly one would learn about those probabilities um, with, the, with the limit point being the so-called Law of Large Numbers. 
So the right is, the, uh, is this perspective of how do I use probability models to analyze data, and these are situations where I don't know the probabilities. I'm sorry, the left. So the right is this painting by Pizarro. Um, what is, what's that doing here? This is a painting of a marketplace. And there's a bunch of people in the marketplace, and these people have to make decisions. Well, when they're trying to figure out how many goods to bring to the market, they don't know, they, they don't know what the demand will be for their goods. They, may, they have to make guesses. So they're also engaged in confronting uncertainty. More generally, people inside the models that we build also confront uncertainty. So there's the perspective from the Jacob Bernoulli perspective on the left where you've got maybe some model, but you don't know the prob yeah, you're a statistician and you don't know the probabilities. Yeah, um, and there's the perspective of people inside the model and, and, and they're making decisions. They have to also confront uncertainty. So I think these, these are kind of two different perspectives, two different vantage points of uncertainty to an economist that are important. So this is why economics is different than some of the physical sciences, sciences in the sense that we have people inside our models, and people inside our models have to also confront this uncertainty. So I like to draw this distinction uh, uh, between uncertainty and economic analysis. There's that that outside a model. So, given, so suppose you're a researcher, a so-called econometrician, that uh, you're given a dynamic ec economic model, but there may be parameters of that model you don't know. Uh, there may be, uh, you have to use data to figure that out. You may have competing models on the table and you don't know which is the correct one and you want to figure out which is the better model that fits the data. Uh, for any given model, you want to uh, uh, assess the empirical implications of it. So that's the kind of the usual statisticians or econometrician approach to models. It's also inside the model. So when we're building the model itself in, 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 a, in a dynamic context, we have to depict economic actors. We've got consumers and uh, enterprises or even policymakers inside our models, and they have to cope with uncertainty. Just like in that painting by Pizarro, there's you know, that you know, those people coming to the marketplace have to comp uh, confront this uncertainty. So this is so so this inside the model notion is we we as we, as we model individuals as they as they um, cope with this uncertainty. Uh, this this has implications for what prices clear markets. It has implications for the outcomes uh, the outcomes of these markets in, in terms of resource allocation. So how resources get allocated. So you know you're an investor and you're trying to figure out uh, what a profitable investment is. You have to make guesses about the future, and that affects your decision making. And then and that and now you have popul you know now you have whole economies of these investors and the like. And so uncertainty uh, so uncertainty f um, is a key part of the model building state uh, the, of the of the model building as well. So I want to be focusing a lot of attention today on investors inside an economic model. Um, I, uh, I've, I've been, you know, a lot of the first part of my academic career was about taking a model and estimating parameters and 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 uh, and, and assessing model implications. And I found that to be something very very hard enterprise to be doing. Uh, but the same challenges that I as an external analyst are doing, also people inside our models confront. And that's what I, I that's so I, so I've been trying to shift attention towards that inside the model perspective. So here I've just repeated what, I've just repeated what I said previously in this fact that there's this inside perspective we really need to think, we need to come to grips with how we want to model people. Uh -huh. So I'm going to be taking the, I'm going to be viewing this from the standpoint of uh, asset valuation. So let me kind of think about this in a little bit of an abstract and you know, potentially simplified way, um, but, but actually a fairly rich way. So let me just imagine there's this pro stochastic process, I'll call it G. And G is going to capture some form of stochastic growth uh, between, say, GT is just growth between 0 and P. GT is responding to a whole bunch of shocks out there and the like. Um, and and those, uh, those, those shocks then are captured by, uh, they compound over time and they show up in this process. So this GT could be uh, um, area consumption of a, for, or it could be um, investment or output or the like. It's some type of process and it can potentially grow over time. So that's stochastic growth. It, it, you know, the, the growth effect, you're compounding here and, and, uh, and, it's, and we're going to capture that. There's also stochastic discounting that shows up in, into play. So this is, a, and this is also going to be modeled as a, as a process. So I'll call this process S. And 
Now, what S does uh, um, is assign so-called risk-adjusted prices to cash flows at date T. So, you know, the thing about doing asset valuations about is, 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 is about discounting. So we have some type of cash flow, if you like, uh, or this could be some you know, macro, macro process as well. Um, as I change GT, I might change how processes are exposed to risk. ST, then, when I do the valuation, I, I basically have to, in effect, discount different uh, cash flows and different states of the world in order to make the appropriate risk adjustments. I can't just discount, I just can't discount all cash flows the same way because they have different exposures to risk. So, so a convenient way to think about how that valuation goes is that I form, I take the cash flow GT, I discount it by the stochastic discount factor ST, and I form conditional expectations of that then this encodes all the various different risk adjustments. Okay. So this is kind of a, uh, a common way of doing uh, valuation, except I've, I have to make sure that I encode all the so-called risk adjustments. Now, I'm going to eventually be going on risk adjustments to think about more general uncertainty adjustments, but, this, but, but let me just kind of start here. So what the stochastic discount factor here does is it encodes investor preferences through things like intertemporal margin rates and substitution. And, and I'll kind of work through what you know, some examples of exactly what that is. Okay. And so, you know, investors, they, they, they have to confront this, uh, um, uh, the riskiness in the marketplace. I have to represent prices, or I have to re represent how the valuation takes place. And formulas like this are convenient ways to capture precisely that. Now, this ST can represent investor preferences, but it's so-called. But this is for the marginal investor, for the investor who's actively participating at that point in time. So things like market structure play a role here. You know, you know what's my assumed structure about how these investors interact? Um, that's also plays a role in this construction of S. So when I write down a fully specified economic model, um, among other things, it's going to give me a, a S. And that S is going to tell me how to assign prices to various different assets. And the S is going to have a T subscript because as I change the investment horizon, it's going to tell me how to do this valuation. Okay. So, um, so, so, part of the, so part of my interest today is how, how to get interesting models of ST that actually uh, are consistent with data. So I'm going to be using... Um, uh, I'm going to start off using recursive valuation formulas that are very, very useful in practice. And these ideas for this uh, uh, come back, go all the way back to uh, uh, Charlie Koopmans, who was doing important work on this in the early 80s. Uh, it's, it's, it was extended by Krebs and Porteous and been brought into the asset pricing literature by Epstein and Zinn. And what this literature does is it highlights how uncertainty about future events affects asset valuation. And the way it's going to show up is all, the channel is going to show up is, is, is through this so-called stochastic discount factor. So, you know, I could give you all the details of the fully specified economic model. I'm going to try to cut to the chase here and kind of focus on this uh, valuation channel through the stochastic discount factor. What we'll see then is we'll start leading to ways in which expectations about the future and uncertainty are going to show up in the, in the, in the in the asset valuation. So people's perceptions are going to matter here, but the, and they're going to matter in ways that are very, that are very central. So I'm going to, I'm, these models tell us how beliefs about the future are reflected in, in current period assessments through so-called continuation values. I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll be specific about that. And we'll see how forward-looking nature of this recursive utility model provides an additional channel which perceptions about the future matter. So, so what this recursive uh, what this recursive valuation model is going to be doing, and this has been used in a lot of uh, recent research in asset pricing, is it's going to be give you this channel where beliefs about the future matter in, very, in, in really central ways, in, in ways that, are, um, uh, that enhance the impact of uncertainty. Okay, so that's what, so let me kind of work through a simple up five version of this. So this is a recursive utility model. It's recursive because what it's going to be doing here is the following. Suppose I'm, I'm going to start off with a so-called continuation value, Vt plus 1. So that's going to tell me how I think about my consumption profile prospectively all the way into the future. Okay. And then I'm going to, uh, and so just imagine I'm, I'm given a Vt plus 1 here. Uh, so that's the, that's the continuation value of this process plan tomorrow. Right. 
I'm gonna, the first thing I'm going to do is I take that Vt plus 1 here. I've dropped a 1 here by accident. This would be Vt plus 1. I'm going to make a so-called risk adjustment of that continuation value. I'm going to take it to the power 1 minus gamma. Gamma is going to be uh, typically... Uh, it's, um, is, is typically be positive, uh, and, the, and this is going to capture curvature uh, it, to, to, or risk aversion on the part of investors. So I take that to the power 1 minus gamma. This is just a, a simple parameterization of it, one that's used a lot in practice. I, I'm going to take its conditional expectation, and I'm going to just for convenience undo the impact of that power 1 minus gamma. So if I actually knew what Vt plus 1 was here, if I had full, if I, if I actually knew the future, this whole calculation would do nothing. It would just, re you know, would just return back Vt plus 1. But since I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, uh, uh, this will make an adjustment, a so-called risk adjustment in the continuation value. Then I'm going to take that. I'm going to discount it. I'm going to raise it to this power 1 minus rho. So rho is uh, the parameter 1 minus rho economists like to think of as an intertemporal substitution parameter. And I'm going to... Uh, uh, do the same thing to the current period consumption, raise that to the power of 1 minus rho, and I'm just going to undo it in the outside, outside here with 1 over 1 minus rho for, for uh, convenience. Continuation values are always going to be defined only up to monotone transformations, and I've just uh, picked a very convenient one here in this, in, in this particular circumstances. So rho is how I think about things intertemporally. You know, even if there are, you know, even if I knew the future perfectly, uh, the parameter rho would matter. It, it's, 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 it's affecting how I substitute consumption over time in, uh, intertemporally. Delta is a pure discount rate, a pure discount effect. So this is a standard recursive utility model, I, and there's kind of three key parameters here. Delta, that's about discounting the future. Gamma, that's about risk aversion, X or, or enhanced risk aversion. And rho, at 1 over rho, is, is this intertemporal substitution parameter here. So, so, so this is a rich enough, th this is a, this kind of three parameter model has been used extensively in a lot of the macro financial, uh, in a lot of the models kind of with making macro financial linkages. Um, now, so now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to form a so-called intertemporal margarita substitution. To, to, to produce this, I'm going to, I'm going to literally be c computing a bunch of derivatives. Um, I learned early on when, in my teaching career that you don't differentiate in public you'll, because, because you'll embarrass yourself. So what I'd like you to do is have, have you take this formula on faith, uh, and, and it's not very hard to derive, but I, but I won't bother you with the algebra. But basically what I'm doing is, is, is I'm kind of looking at the intertemporal margarita substitution over one period between trade-offs between today and tomorrow. I'm kind of looking at marge utility, uh, marge utility calculations tomorrow relative to today. I'm kind of differentiating through that recursion, which I just had on the, on, the, uh, on the previous slide. So if I do that, I produce this ratio of the stochastic discount factor between date t plus 1 and date t. I just differentiate through that recursion, and, and I get three terms here. A pure discount term, x to the minus delta. I get uh, an intertemporal substitution term, ct plus 1 over ct to the minus rho. And, th and then I get this additional term, Vt plus 1 over the risk-adjusted version of Vt plus 1 raised to the power rho minus gamma. So I've just rewritten here what this risk adjustment is all about. Okay. Now what's interesting about this formula is the following. One is suppose that rho and gamma are the same. If rho and gamma are the same, I, uh, this term drops out. And rho and gamma is the same is a model. It's, a, it, it's, a, it's the common model used in macroeconomics. It's the kind of the power utility model of preferences. Uh, and, and, and that's the one, however, when, once you start looking at asset market data, is known to be, uh, behave very poorly. Uh, the, it, it just doesn't get the, it just doesn't get risk, it, it's, it's, it's not rich enough to confront asset market data. So, but, it's, but it's one that's been used extensively in the literature. It's kind of the discounted expected utility model and so with, with a power utility function. That's rho minus gamma, but, it's, but this term gets eliminated. When rho is different than gamma, and, and in practice what happens is the parameters being used are, is, is the value of gamma is much bigger than rho, often. Um, this term comes into play. Here I'm looking at valuation between 
that uh, discounting between period one and period t plus one and period t. I'm looking over, so I'm looking at valuation over a single period here. However, it depends on the future. Bt plus one, I solved that recursion. You know, I gave you the one period version of it, so let me just go back one step here again. Um, to take this forward, I, 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 should, I should emphasize this. This is how I go from t plus one to t, day t. What you do in practice then is, is solve this recursion over, you iterate on this. So you start at day t plus, um, ta, uh, uh, t plus tau, say, where tau is some really big number. You start off with some terminal condition, and then you work backwards in order to get, get, uh, get the continuation values. So doing, what you do is you get a formula for Vt as a function of current consumption and a whole bunch of future, and a whole bunch of future consumptions. So, this is re so the way that this re recursion works is you start off with a terminal condition and then you iterate backwards. So what BT, what BT characterizes is all the future, is, 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 is your uh, um, beliefs about future consumptions here. So now let's go back to this formula which I had. Your beliefs about the future all get conveniently summarized in this BT plus one. I might have to numerically compute that, you know, the solution to that recursion, but I, I, they all get captured by here. So even though this ST plus 1 over ST is how I'm doing one period asset valuation, I have a, a, a between date T plus 1 and date T, that's going to depend on the entire, my beliefs about the future and uncertainty about the future through continuation values. So this, so this gives a very mathematically tractable way to, uh, uh, to proceed. So as I say, when rho is equal to 1, this term drops out, in ge but, but in general it's there. Um, or where rho is equal to gamma. There's another case that's, that, 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 that's a nice simplification, and that's the case where rho is equal to 1, the, the so-called unitary elasticity case. In that set of circumstances, this term here now becomes 1 minus rho, but look at what RT plus one, RT VT plus 1 is. It's this term here raised to the 1 over 1 minus gamma. So I raise the whole thing, that to the 1 minus gamma, I'm just getting, uh, I've, I've got VT plus 1 to the 1 minus gamma divided by its conditional expectation. That says this term here, by construction, has conditional expectation 1. It's a positive random variable, conditional expectation 1. That, uh, uh, there's actually a dual interpretation of this as a type of distorted beliefs, which I will come back to later because it's uh, going to have some appeal. So right now it's just an observation that this term here is conditional expectation 1 in the special case. But, uh, okay, so what I want to take out of this is, I'm, you know, even if I'm looking at what happens between date t and date t plus 1 for valuation purposes, it's going to depend on the future through continuation values. It's going to Okay, now how do I want to, yeah, yeah, I can write down EPSAT formulas, but, you know, what do I really get out of those formulas? I, you know, what, I, I, I'm going to have to figure out ways to unpack them that are kind of interesting and, and, and valuable. So here, let me kind of appeal to some authority here in the sense of uh, Ragnar Frisch, the first Nobel, one of the first two Nobel laureates in economics, studied the so-called impulse problem. Um, macroeconomists, have applied, empirical macroeconomists are all the time these days using impulse response functions. Their origins trace back to uh, this paper by Ragnar Frisch on the impulse problem, in which he said, well, I want to think about the, an economy in which you're kind of ex repeatedly exposed to these erratic shocks. Okay. Uh, they, they, they're constantly influencing the dynamic evolution. This is kind of the typical way dynamic stochastic models are built in macroeconomics these days. Um, and he said, and he kind of characterizes, and he says, kind of characterizing how the system responds to these, these erratic shocks is a, is kind of a useful tool. And, the, and, and this is, yeah, as I say, impulse response functions are kind of used extensively. So what happens in macroeconomics is you might have different shocks. You might have a technology shocks monetary policy shocks, uh, government spending shocks. Uh, what you do is you trace through what the model tells you how uh, variables like consumption, investment, output all respond to those shocks. So it's, so it's a shock tomorrow uh, that influences those variables in, uh, in all future time periods, and that's what these impulse response functions trace out. So, so, so that's a very rich literature. It's been developed. It's, it's a way to quantify the impact of alternative different shocks. Okay. Now, I'm interested in the valuation counterparts to this, and here kind of let me appeal, you know, go back to Irving, Irving Fisher, Fisher's work, in which the manner in which risk operates upon time preference will differ, among other things, according to the particular periods in the future to which it, that risk applies. So now think of a dynamical system. You have a shock tomorrow. 
that shock affects things like consumption in all future dates. Okay? If you imagine models with these decentralized markets, um, if you're exposed to that shock, that shock's affecting consumption in future periods, that's going to have implications for how the, uh, that, uh, uh, that consumption gets valued. So I can now, I want to kind of go beyond the Ragnar Frisch approach to actually assign prices, if you will, to, the, to, uh, to, uh, to these different shocks in order, uh, in order to get kind of characterizations to how these, these risk prices are kind of working through this model, say. I just had the recursive utility model. So I'm going to use that, those type of calculations. I'm going to extend the Ragnar Frisch approach to thinking about kind of a valuation counterpart. I'm going to be effectively assigning risk prices to these different shocks. Investors in security markets, they're exposed to risk. They have to get compensated. That, those formulas, which I just wrote down, allows me to figure out what those compensations are. Okay. So I'm going to think about dynamic asset pricing through taking cash flows, consumptions if you like, alter their exposure to shocks, and see what happens to prices. So I'm going to say the implication of a price today, I'm going to change exposure tomorrow, and it's going to have an impact on a cash flow, say consumption, in all the future dates. These are going to give, give what I think of as so-called shock price elasticities. I'm going to normalize the exposure, and I'm, going to, and I'm going to study their impact by looking at the kind of logarithms of expected returns. So I'm going to compute the expected return changes when I change exposures. And that's then going to give me these uh, kind of uh, uh, entities represented in terms of um, elasticities, and they're going to be counterparts to what shows up in the finance literature as, uh, um, as kind of uh, risk prices. It's going to be the pricing counterpart to impulse response functions. And we have several papers looking at the, you know, the, you know, the formal justifications as well as the implementations of these type of methods. Okay. So there's going to be... <laughs> In asset pricing and the asset valuation in general, then, I, I'm, I'm going to think about there being two channels. There's going to be a quantity channel and a price channel. So I've got a stochastic cash flow. I talked about this GT process before. I can alter how that's exposed to shocks. That's the quantity channel. So, to, so, so like how does a shock, um, as I change one of the shocks, how does that affect the cash flow in the future? That's going to be the counterpart to impulse response functions, but I'm going to think of that as kind of exposure elasticity. And then there's going to be a price channel. Right? Where, uh, um, as I change the shocks, as I change the exposure, it's going to impact the prices. A risk premia, you know, we often talk about risk premia in financial markets. It's got these two pieces to it. Uh, a risk premium can be enhanced because exposure changes. It can be enhanced because the price changes. There's a price change and a quantity change to it. The risk premium involves uh, both of those pieces together, and, and I find it interesting to unpack them. A lot of research in, uh, in, in the study of financial markets is all about how risk premia are kind of changing according horizon and over time. There's observations that risk premium are bigger in bad times than good times. Um, I want to unbundle that. Uh, are those risk premium bad, better, you know, bigger in bad times and good times because prices are bigger or because the, the exposures are bigger or both? So I want to uh, be, have the tools to allow me to, to think about unpacking the, these, uh, these risk premia into price effects and quantity effects. So this is some of the work that we've done on this uh, um, that, that, that's, that, that, that's been published to date. Um, so I could give a whole lecture on the mechanics of this, but I, but I want to take it out for a ride and kind of see what we get out of it. So excuse the kind of a bit tedious mathematics here, but I want to write down a really simplified version of a dynamic macro system. This is, you know, typically the macro economy, I, I'm going to have to build a much richer model of technologies and, and, uh, um, and, 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 uh, and investment decisions and consumption decisions and the like. Suppose I'm, just, I, I'm going to look at a really simplified version. Suppose that just for pedagogical reasons. So I'm going to have, a I'm going to have this economy in which there's uh, the arid consumption coming out of the, you know, the equilibrium arid consumption evolves according to a process like this. In logarithms, it's got a term that, a that affects the growth. It's got a kind of this constant growth contribution, and it's got a stochastic growth contribution coming from this xt1. So, so, so I'm going to have the state variable xt1 that's kind of capturing predictability and macro growth. I'm going to have a second process, xt2, that's going to capture stochastic volatility. 
So there's this macroeconomy. There's uncertain growth in the future. That's captured by XP1. There's uncertain volatility in the future. That's captured by XP2. So this is going to be a model of so-called stochastic volatility and stochastic growth. Right. I'm going to just, for, for, you know, just for purpose of illustration, have three shocks. So there's going to be a direct shock to consumption. There's, um, there's going to be shocks to the growth rates and shocks to volatility. I'm going to take these different components. I'm going to call one. I'm going to design it so one's a permanent shock, one's a transitory shock to, to the macroeconomy, and a third one's stochastic volatility. So I'm taking model. I'm going to take numerical values here out of a prominent paper by uh, 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 by Bonds on your own in order to il you know, illustrate this effects. So what's going to show in order to illustrate how this forward-looking channel from recursive utility operates? Okay. So I'm going to have three shocks. Think of one as a permanent shock, one's a transitory shock, and then the third one is a shock to stochastic volatility. Those are all driving around processes like consumption, arid consumption. Uh, uh, um, and, they're, and, and they're working through this channel here. See, this, X, this XP2 here, the square root is kind of showing up here everywhere, so it's kind of scaling the volatility in the economy. And it itself is evolving stochastically, as is... Uh, or that's XP2, as is XP1. Okay. So this is going to be a simplified model. In general, I would have a, you know, you know, a, a much more complicated setup here, but this is just to illustrate things. So, so this is an economy where I've got these three different shocks, and they all, uh, they're all affecting consumption, and they're all, uh, also uh, there's pricing consequences for all three. So I, I've got the recursive utility model. I can compute stochastic discount factors. I, I can do it you know, num you know, numerically, and I can figure out the asset pricing values. Right. So here's what you get out of these calculations. I'm going to do two models. I'm going to do the recursive utility model where, where kind of gamma and rho are different. I'm, I'm going to look at situations where risk aversion is substantial and the elasticity of intertemporal substitution for convenience all sets of one. That's the, that, that's the, that, that's the all, all the blue lines here. I'm going to compare that to a power utility model, the one that was conventionally used in macroeconomics, where, where rho and gamma are the same, and this forward-looking channel is, is eliminated. And then I'm going to start looking at these, uh, uh, these price calculations. So we've got three different shocks, permanent shocks, transitory shocks, shocks of stochastic volatility. Now let's first look at the power utility model. The power utility model is this red line. Okay? So what happens here is um, these prices, these price elasticities, start off small, and they eventually grow for the, uh, for the, uh, for the permanent shock. So this permanent shock works its way through the dynamical system. It eventually uh, uh, leads to very big prices as, I, as, as they go across investment horizons. Now this recursive, uh, the power utility model, what happens is that the responses, uh, it's going to imitate the, response, uh, the, uh, the responses to consumption. There's no forward-looking piece to it, and so I could pretty much, if I did the impulse response functions to consumption, it would have the same pattern here as, a, 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 as in this red line. What happens here is the prices, the risk prices, start off small and are eventually large. They have to go to uh, a way out on the, for larger and larger investment horizons in, in, in order to get the big effects. What the recursive utility model does, though, is that it, it's got this forward-looking piece to it. It's really emphasizing risk aversion instead of, intertemporal, instead of large intertemporal substitution elasticities or small intertemporal substitution elasticities. And they get, they get the big effects immediately here. So what you get out of the, out of the recursive utility model is if you, even if you look at short-run risk-return trade-offs, risk-return trade-offs over a quarter or a week or whatever, they become much more substantial. And they're substantial over all investment horizons. It's a, it's a fairly flat trajectory. Okay. Um, so the recursive utility model gets the big prices immediately. The power utility model gets them eventually. That's for permanent shocks. Okay. So in this recursive utility model, you really care about these permanent shocks, and, 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 the, and they show up in big risk. Uh, prices immediately. And that's the effect of one of the effects that bombs on your own are trying to emphasize. You can get these big kicks immediately through this forward-looking channel. Now let's think about a temporary shock. So the temporary shock, the macroeconomy is hit by the shock and then it, uh, then it eventually comes down. So if I had the impulse response function for consumption here, it, w it, it would be a pattern just like this red line. E e e um, the prices for the power utility model kind of track that red line. And they start off 
notable and then just diminish to zero. The recursive utility model, the forward looking channel kicks in. You care a lot about the future. Who cares about temporary, uh, who cares, uh, you know, who care, you know, the investor really doesn't care that much about temporary shocks to begin with. And the prices, that shows up in the price effects being tiny right in the outset. So in the recursive utility model, the temporary, uh, uh, the temporary shock gets tiny prices, risk prices immediately, and, 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 and then eventually go to zero. Power utility model, they're, they're kind of notable and then diminish. So, so they have very different pricing implications in terms of the patterns. Now let's go to stochastic volatility. Again, for the power utility model, the, you know, the impact of stochastic volatility, it takes a while to work through the system. It starts off small and gets big. Uh, you, you get uh, impulse response functions proportional to this red line here. The prices look kind of just like uh, that, that, that pick up that pattern. So you eventually get big prices uh, uh, when, the, when, the, um, uh, when the investment horizons get large. For the recursive utility model, your forward-looking channel, this thing kicks in um, notable right at the outset and then, and, and then has a very flat trajectory. Uh, mathematically, that stochastic discount factor here for the recursive utility model behaves kind of like a martingale, and that's what's given these flat trajectories. Okay, so what's interesting here is stochastic volatility. So what's stochastic volatility doing in this model? Remember that the, this is a macroeconomy in which there's uh, these persistent movements in, in, in stochastic volatility. This model, they're highly persistent, and that's what's showing up here, this, uh, the impact of this persistence. Stochastic volatility is doing two things. Look at this blue, this blue thing, uh, there's a band here, not just a line. What's going on here is that there's fluctuations in these prices, and this is the kind of uh, interquartile range of that, of that variation. So, so, so the price responses are somewhere in the interquartile range or in this band here, and they're, and they're fluctuating. So the fact there's a band here is what's showing up the, uh, as the um, stochastic volatility. So stochastic volatility is moving around this price here. That's part of what it's doing. Exposure to stochastic volatility also gets priced. So stochastic volatility is moving around the prices of, uh, of, of these other shocks, but, but it itself, exposure to that gets prices. Now, quantitatively, this is much smaller than this here, like you know, by a factor of over four, you know, five or six. The way that the literature's gone, the asset pricing literature's gone, is that uh, is what people have done is cranked up the, vol uh, the persistence in stochastic volatility. It makes stochastic volatility more and more uh, more persistent. So, so, so there's very low frequency swings in, the, in, in uh, macro volatility. By doing that, this price gets bigger. You can, you, you, you can ramp up this price. And so some more recent literature's added, per added that persistence and that's driven up this, and, and, that's, and, th and that's driven up the level here. But, but these models, the Cathy volatility do, does two things. It moves around these prices, but exposure to it also gets priced. In these calculations, that price is modest. In, in, in other models, it becomes much more substantial. Tools like I've talked about here, which are novel to us, I believe, uh, um, I think really help us understand though, the di uh, asset pricing from a much more dynamic perspective. And we really see the role of, of this forward-looking channel here kicking in and, and, and the fact that there's these flat trajectories and they're big right at the outset. So this is kind of how this recursive utility model works. It's the permanent shocks that, 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 uh, that get the biggest prices, and the price responses are very flat. They're, they're, they're kind of big at the outset in contrast to this, the usual power utility model. So some people, and a lot of people in the asset, macro asset pricing literature, basically want to stop here. They uh, declare success. The price, the shocks that get, that, that get priced are the, are, are the uh, shocks to the macro growth instead of the temporary shocks. Uh, it's the shocks that uh, uh, sometimes the Cassie volatility gets big prices if you crank up the persistence. Is this mechanism a success? Okay. Now, the way this mechanism works is we impose rational expectations. What that means is that that evolution equation I wrote down there for consumption, for this consumption dynamics, investors know all the parameters of that. I, I, um, I do the calculations of this as if investors have figured everything out. They don't know the shocks, but they know all the parameters. And then, I, and then we do the calculations. If they happen to have all that knowledge, they knew the parameters, then we can show how beliefs about the future then can have a big effect on, 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 uh, on, on the asset pricing. Now, the literature itself acknowledges that 
Some of these things are, are, are um, statistically subtle. To tease out precise estimates of the persistence of macroeconomic growth is not very easy. Uh, in, in fact, it, you know, econometric estimates of it are, are, are in, in general, uh, convey a fair amount of uh, statistical uncertainty. Per stochastic volatility is even harder to, the persistence in stochastic volatility is even harder to estimate. For, uh, for a statistician trying to estimate that, uh, the, the, pers the persistence in the macro, macro volatility is, is, uh, is, is really a challenge to figure out. So, so this is a model. This is, a, this is a, um, uh, an approach under which investors have things figured out. The econometricians don't, uh, aren't quite so sure. The proponents of this literature will say the following. Well, asset prices, um, we, these effects are there because um, they, uh, they give rise to these big pricing effects. We know we need big prices for, for, uh, for some of these shocks. Uh, the asset prices reveal the fact that they uh, must be there. But where is this the investor confidence coming from? The, that, that story works to the fact that investors have things figured out and econometricians don't. Um, Moreover, stochastic volatility, the stochastic volatility piece is important in order to explain data, but where does that come from? Uh, in these models, it's just exogenously specified. So these, uh, um, that, yeah, that, these, so, so there's two pieces of this that I think is, well, three, uh, those that, that I'm concerned about. Where does the confidence come from? Where is the stochastic volatility coming from? And finally, uh, something that I didn't emphasize a lot, but risk aversion is seemingly large in here. The so-called relative risk aversion parameter is 10. Uh, that's, the, uh, in my calculations, that's a large number. In this literature, it gets up to 20. If you go to the uh, San Francisco Fed studying their term structure model, it goes all the way up to 100. So uh, um, if this is pure risk aversion and you start looking at direct evidence on how risk averse people are, how they behave uh, in situations where they know probabilities, uh, th th this will appear to be very, very extreme behavior. So what interests me is to is to take the success here in question mark and, and see if we can't get at these same type of phenomenon with a little bit different approach. I want to get rid of investor confidence. I want to try to generate some of the volatility endogenously, and I want to replace large risk aversion by something else. Okay. So to do this, I have to think about uncertainty much more broadly speaking. So right now, the investors inside our model is all about risk. They... Uh, I, uh, they don't know the shocks are going to occur in the future, but they, de but they know the macro dynamics. So risk, I think of as what probabilities does a model assign to, uh, to events in the future? I wrote down a model. I wrote down all the parameters, and then I did a bunch of calculations given those parameters. That's all about risk. Now there's model ambiguity. The way, that the, uh, uh, the way we proceed so far is all that's just an econometrician from the outside may not know things. So a econometrician from the outside may struggle with estimating stochastic volatility. He'll look at the asset pricing data, and that says to explain the data, uh, volatility has to be very, very persistent, so therefore we'll, we'll, we'll take it to be very persistent. Um, that's putting a lot of faith on the uh, people inside the model figuring stuff out. And, I, and, and so I want to pass on some of that concern about not knowing which is the right model, not knowing what the parameters are. I want to pass that model ambiguity on to the investors inside the model. Third, I want to go one step further. These models I wrote down, the one I wrote down there is really simplified. You know, we don't want to literally take that as a model of the macroeconomy. Uh, it's missing a bunch of little you know, you know, you know, features. We expect the macroeconomy is far more complex than this. But it might still be a useful model. In general, our models of macroeconomics of that character. In fact, general models in, in all disciplines are that character. Models by their very nature are simplifications. They're, they help us think about the world in simplified ways, but they're not, they're not meant to be a literal, uh, you know, complete description of what goes on. So we work with misspecified models all, all the time. Uh, how do we use models that are not, not perfect in ways that are sensible? I think of that as a kind of an important third component to, um, uh, to uncertainty. And I want to figure out ways to address some of this stuff. So one approach to this is uh, subjective probability. There's the Bayesian decision paradigm has become a demonstratively successful paradigm through all, all statistical disciplines. It, it, it's, uh, it's numerically convenient, often through, through recursive learning and updating formulas, through applying Bayes' rule. The way subjective probability works is the following, is that, well, 
I've got, I've got these unknown parameters. I put some prior on them initially, and then I let my data update them, and then and then my data tells me over time what the uh, uh, what so-called posterior probabilities are are over those um, parameters. So one way to go with the previous calculations is to replace it by a pure Bayesian calculation. I, I just endow investors with some prior instead of knowledge of the parameters. Uh, who knows what you want to start it off with, but suppose I start off with something, and then I kind of redo all the calculations. Uh, um, I'd, applying subjective probabilities in, in, uh, uh, and, and, and subjective probability theory. And, it, and big conceptual contributors to this were DiFanetti, the uh, uh, Italian probabilist statistician, and Savage uh, from, the, uh, from, uh, from, the, uh, from the University of Chicago. Savage produced this elegant axiomatic system defending subjective probabilities. And, and it's really, you know, it's really very elegant work. Why don't we just stop there? That would be one way to go. In fact, there's interesting work that's done precisely what I just described, applying directly Bayesian methods. Um, so I'm sympathetic to that, except, you know, how do we really, you know, first of all, it doesn't deal with models as approximators uh, and potentially misspecified. Second, how do we do this weighting? Uh, is it really that easy to figure out how to weight models and weight parameters through, through specifications of priors? So DeFinetti and Savage, both, even though they were big advocates of subjective utility uh, or subjective probabilities, they sub say subjectivists should be obliged to recognize that any opinion is only vaguely acceptable. So it's important to know not to know only to know the exact answer for an exactly specified problem, but what happens in changing in a reasonable neighborhood of the assumed opinion. To me, this is a call for doing robustness, robust Bayesian methods, as, and, and not just uh, stopping with a single prior, but looking for sensitivity. Savage, relatedly, uh, a, a, after producing his elegant axiomatic system, no matter how neat modern operational definitions of personal probability may look, it's usually possible to determine personal probabilities of events only very crudely. Again, there's uncertainty here about how you uh, I input these subjective input. Uh, uncertainty in, in terms of the subjective inputs which you uh, put into Bayesian calculations. So I think that type of sensitivity analysis remains very important and, and I think it's, uh, um, so I'd like to be using these Bayesian methods and more of a, from more of the vantage point of robustness and at least put on the table as well questions that models may be misspecified or are misspecified. So let me kind of put another picture here. Before I did uh, um, Pizarro, now I'm going to do Latour. So why, uh, so why this picture? So let me start off with a game of chance. Um, now, in, tr in, in true cards is more uh, more than a simple game of chance, just because of the, the, the game theoretic components to it as well. But you know, let me just think of cards as, say, roughly speaking, a game of chance. That's the image of the person um, all the way to your right. The person l looking at cards and you know, has a certain amount of money and, and thinks he's playing some fair card game against others. Now I can look at the person on the left. The person on the left has some cards behind his back. That's why this, presumably this painting is called the cheat. Um, and... Uh, and, 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 and unbeknownst to this person on the right, uh, there, there, there's a swindle going on here. Presumably that the dealer, look at the dealer's eyes, presumably the dealer is involved in this as well, uh, in, in, uh, including against the innocent person all the way on the right. I'm not quite sure the status of the person pour, uh, pouring drinks, but uh, that person may well be on the cheat as well, in on the cheat. So what does this have to do with anything? If I want to start doing this robustness analysis, if I want to start doing what DeFinetti's and Savage were, were suggesting, doing this prior sensitivity, I have to do prior sensitivity to what? Uh, you know, uh, the prior sensitivity I'm going to care about are the ones that are most consequential. So we can start doing robustness analysis with a decision problem. Um, I'm going to, to, to make cautious adjustments, and I'm going to start looking at, well, maybe, maybe the model's not quite right. So the way this works is one can invent a person out there to cheat. Who, uh, one can invent the person on, uh, on, uh, on your left uh, and, and, and try to see how far could this model go wrong and, 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 and kind of make sure whatever strategies uh, I'm adopting kind of work well when the model's misspecified in ways that are most consequential to decision making. 
So, so robustness when it occurs in the decision theory, control theory, uh, ambiguity aversion is all about, is typically about embedding someone like the person on the left in order to try to figure out what are sensible ways to proceed. Okay. So, so I want to change the, uh, uh, the person on the right here to be thinking about, well, maybe this, maybe this isn't really a fair card game and maybe, there, uh, and maybe I ought to ad I adjust my strategy accordingly. One possibility is not to play, but, but I don't want to throw models out, so I, 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 instead I want to use them in sensible ways. So I'd like to continue to play. So how do we make robustness operational? So it's kind of two different ways that are kind of interconnected, of course. One is I could explore a family of priors or posteriors. So in a dynamic context, there's always this issue of what a prior is. Today's pri posterior is tomorrow's prior as I update through things. So when I'm doing recursive analyses, kind of priors and posteriors are all depending upon um, you know, the dating in your, uh, in your perspective. But, but I want, want to be thinking doing some type of robustness analysis, what happens to do when I'm doing sensitivity here. I want, uh, within this type of approach, dynamic learning still plays a role. I just want to do some robust, counterpart some robust counterparts to Bayesian analysis and look at its consequences. And, and, and make conservative adjustments. So what I'm thinking about then is, is, is replacing risk aversion with this, doing this robustness type of analysis, concerns about model misspecification and doing robustness. In this case, concerns about not knowing what the right prior is. Second is I might say, well, my model's the simplification. This is an abstraction. It could be wrong. So I, I want to start thinking about a whole bunch of perturbations to the, some benchmark model. Uh, subject to some constraints or penalizations, and try to see how, you know, uh, um, how mo in what ways models might go wrong. And again, the, what the, the, the ways I care about are the ones that are most consequential to the decision problem, the ones that have the biggest utility consequences. And um, future perturbations, my, my, when I'm thinking about models being misspecified, the ways they could be misspecified in the future maybe not be tied sim in simple ways to pass past. Uh, to the past, so 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 these would be perturbations in which I are not necessarily learnable. There are changes in the model which are not that, sh yeah, that might occur that are distinct from um, uh, sh sh from what what's happened up to the uh, current time period. So basically, what it does is it develops a decision problem that's going to target members of uh, a family of models that have the largest utility consequences. And so what this is going to do is give rise to a different way of doing analysis. These are this concern for robustness, for model misspecification, or for not knowing what the prior is, are ways to get alternatives to what looks like risk aversion. And, th and this allows me to have investors out there that don't take their model uh, quite so literally. Uh, they're, you know, they, uh, they're concerned about uh, estimation. They're concerned about how you weight across multiple models. They're concerned about their models being misspecified. That concern can imitate risk aversion. So the struggling statistician here now, I want to think about that as a way to imitate risk aversion or to help us, uh, even more potential, uh, potential is to give new sources for uh, fluctuations in these uh, prices so I don't have to appeal to exogenously specified volatility movements. So let me give kind of a simple take on how this asset pricing under distortions work. So for the moment, let's forget about the, the source of the distortion. Let, let me behave, uh, let me be uh, a so-called uh, behavioral finance person and just introduce a belief distortion. My investors don't have the right beliefs. They might have the uh, uh, incorrectly specified beliefs uh, for the moment. And then, and then I'm going to modify that story in just a minute. So what I'm going to do is I, I'm, I'm going to go, go back to my original asset pricing formula. But I'm going to put in a different expectation, a distorted expectation, call it E tilde. And there's going to be a sort of a stochastic discount factor associated that, with that. Call that S tilde. And then I'm going to produce a formula for the asset prices. Okay. So I've got um, a stochastic discount factor and a distorted set of beliefs. Now, mathematically, there's a convenient way to represent distorted beliefs. In a dynamic context, uh, take positive martingales uh, are, are ways to represent belief distortions. You could take a martingale with a unit expectation. It's, 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 it's conditional expectation uh, uh, is going to be 1. And when you think about that as distorting beliefs between date t and date t plus l here, and, and, and this is a way that I can build coherently, consistently, a set of uh, in, in alternative probability models. 
So Martingale's dynamic context are knows, known ways to get uh, uh, internal uh, um, consistent alternative consistent probability specifications. So I'm going to represent this sort of belief as a Martingale. And, w and, and what, what that's going to do then, a positive Martingale, what it's going to do then is it's going to allow me to take this formula here and represent it with the original expectation, a Martingale, time a stochastic discount factor. And now I've got a stochastic discount factor I talked about before is a product of these two pieces. The stochastic discount factor under belief distortion times a martingale. So the S that I was looking at before now has this new piece. So, um, so instead of making risk aversion do all the story to, for coming up with the S, I now have belief distortions coming into play. Okay, so I could just stop here and say, well, I'm just going to introduce ar uh, arbitrary belief distortions. I could appeal to um, animal spirits. I could appeal to you know, various different behavioral anomalies. Okay. I want to add more structure to it. So I've got this new representation in which part of this, what I call the SCSI discount factor is captured by distorted beliefs, but I want to have a structure on where those beliefs come from. We, we, so we know that M has this Martingale interpretation. It also has an interpretation from a statistician as a so-called likelihood ratio. So we know from statistics that likelihood ratios are play a very prominent role. I can think of M as a likelihood ratio of, of, of uh, one model against the uh, distorted model. When that M is close to 1, that distortion is small. And there's a whole variety of statistical criteria out there that tell you when uh, models are hard to distinguish. So we're going to now appeal to statistical criterion to tell me when this M, this distortion is small. The, you know, the question is, if I, if I put alternative models on the table, can I tell them apart with uh, a week's worth of data or, or, or does it take a century's worth of data to uh, tell them apart? Now, now, what, now, now if it's going to take a huge amount of data to tell them apart, then it may make sense that those are the models that investors are willing to consider as, um, as alternatives. So I want to use statistical methods to help me think about when distortions in these these assorted beliefs are statistically small. Oops. Um, wrong pointer. So I want to think about how to use statistics to try to, to try to discipline this that, this M component. So the question then is, can I t have statistically small distortions have important impacts on the stochastic discount factor? And, and, and if they're statistically small, it means that well, investors aren't being that stupid because because it would take so r incredibly rich data set to ever kind of dismiss them and, 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 and kind of pull them from the table. So I want to use this as a way to think about pushing back from rational expectations, but still using the rational expectations intuition. The rational expectation intuition one was that investors figured things out because they had very rich histories of data. With a lot, with, and then with enough enough histories of data, we could do the Bernoulli law of large numbers and figure stuff out. I, w I want to push back from that to say, well, suppose that it's, I uh, imagine uh, after 10 years or 20 years or 50 years, what models might still reasonably be left back on, the, you know, le left on the table to consider. So I, I can kind of use statistical methods here to figure out how big that uh, uh, that 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 distortion can be. Okay. So now I go back to this notion about doing this concern about robustness. Well, the way that robustness, the way you operate for robustness is you consider alternative models on the table, alternative priors, alternative posteriors, or alternative families of models. And, th and then you kind of look at ones, and then you look at the one that has the largest utility consequences, and then you use that as a way to guide decision making uh, in order to put in cautious adjustments. So, so, so instead of risk aversion, it's, it, it's this caution that's coming through this uh, concerns about model misspecification. It can imitate risk aversion, but it's not, but it's distinct from it. So the outcome of uh, models of ambiguity aversion, of concerns about robustness, is a so-called worst-case model. It's not the model you believe. It's the model that you use in order to implement um, more cautious decision-making. So I'm going to think about that as a way to get this uh, so-called distortion in beliefs. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's almost done as a way to make cautious adjustments. Formally, you can apply theories of you know, you know, two-player games, and the decision-maker is optimi optimizing, taking as given a worst-case Formally, I can take this apparatus of, of doing the sensitivity analysis, and I can kind of work backwards. I can say, well, at, um, f first I solve this robust problem. I, 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 I do this kind of every, every time I consider alternative courses of action, I figure out you know, what the utility consequences could be out of misspecification. Um, I, can, I can pose that formula as a two-player game. 
uh, and I can use tools of two-player games and, and produce an ex post interpretation whereby uh, um, I'm acting as if uh, there's an ex post equivalent to acting as if the beliefs had this uh, distorted pattern to them. But, but the motivation is that you want to implement concerns about robustness. Right. So this is exciting to me because it, uh, it's, it's, there's different ways one can proceed. You can start getting new sources of dynamics here, new sources of fluctuations and uncertainty of prices. In our, in, in our work today, we've, we've, we've proceeded along two lines. One is structural misspecification, which I'll uh, illustrate for you in just a minute. And the other is robust learning under misspecification. So, so I'm still applying Bayes' rule, but I'm, but, uh, but I'm doing a robust prior posterior analysis recursively. Both of these you know, methods can, 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 can give rise to kind of new sources of fluctuations in these so-called risk prices, but now they're going to be uncertainty prices. The, so let me illustrate the first one. The second one is uh, recorded in some of the papers here. So let me go back to a model that's kind of similar to the one I talked about before. Uh, here I'm calling it log Y. I should probably just show just determine it log C. Let me, let me get rid of stochastic volatility and just focus on the uh, predictability and growth rates. So, so think there's a single state variable now, X. It's, it's, it's going to be, behave like an autoregression in, in continuous time. And there's going to be these parameters, mu hat, phi hat, and kappa hat driving this. For the moment, I'm going to treat the, uh, uh, there's going to be two shocks instead of three shocks. And for the moment, I'm going to treat the uh, parameters alpha and, uh, and sigma as known. It's continuous time, so these are like bivariate Brownian motions. Now, now I'm going to start thinking about potential alternative models. Well, one is may, you know, maybe, I, maybe, maybe I know these parameters, maybe I don't, so maybe I can start moving around the parameters, mu hat, phi hat, and kappa hat in different ways. Maybe they fluctuate over time. Maybe there's a, a different parameter for every time period. Uh, uh, so maybe there's kind of very small time variation in the parameters. Come, uh, in the parameters. Or maybe things are misspecified in some other way as well. I want to le at least allow for the mu phi the, the mu hat, phi hat, and kappa hat to be misspecified, to be a little bit off. Uh, I'm going to want to allow for them to be, you know, may, maybe be time varying parameters. I don't want to take a precise stand on how they might vary in the future. I, I, I don't want to be able to have to write down the, some formal process for that and specify it. But I want to allow them to fluctuate a little bit. So I'm going to pose this as a kind of a so called robust social planners problem supported by decentralized financial markets. So I'm going to use a tool that I'm, it's, 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 I'm, going, to, I'm going to be a solve a decision, a robust decision problem, but, but, but uh, then justify it as a one that can be supported by, you know, by financial markets. And then I'm going to kind of mechanically solve out this, uh, this worst case model by solving out a, 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 um, a two player game. So I'm going to do those calculations. I'm going to allow for there to be these structural forms of misspecification on mu, phi, and kappa. So let's see where I go with that. So what I'm going to do is the following. Um, I'm going to use a, a construct out of statistics. So there's a beautiful paper written by uh, Chernoff back in the early 50s. It kind of uh, it was uh, initiated uh, uh, interest in statistics to something called large deviation theory. Here's what Chernoff was doing. Chernoff said, suppose I have two models, model A, model B. I want to start telling. I want to start asking um, how easy it is to tell model A from model B, given data. For Chernoff, it was IID, but in general, we, we, need, we need time if we want to do more, more general Markov models. So Chernoff's looking at IID data, and, and, and he's going to say, I'm going to think about models being close together as ones in which um, I, I can discriminate easily from the data, and I'm going to think about models that are. Um, I'm sorry, models that are far apart are ones that I, can that I can tell apart from data easily, and models that are close together are models that take a huge amount of data to, to tell apart. So what he starts doing is he, is he, is he, is he finally poses a, a Bayesian calculation under which they say, you, you announce some prior over the two models, get data, and then start looking at how quickly you can, um, uh, and, and then you're asked to classify, you're asked to say, well, it's model A or model B from historical data. Start classifying the number of mistakes. The more data you get, the less likely you are to make mistakes. So he starts computing mistake probabilities, counterparts to type one and type two errors, which you might make in you know, model selection. Um, 
Okay, so, so the probabilities are going to decay. It's a Bayesian problem, so type 1 and type 2 errors are going to both decay. Uh, they're, and they're, and they're going to decay geometrically or, or in continuous time uh, uh, um, exponentially. That is your uh, Bayesian is going to trade off type 1 and type 2 errors. It's going to make them both small. And the more data you get, the, small, the, the smaller those type 1 and type 2 errors are going to get. You can that, then characterize that in terms of uh, so-called churn-off entropy, but I'm going to map it into half-lives of uh, how much data it, it, it would take to reduce the, uh, 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 the mistake probabilities by, um, by, uh, by a factor of two. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply that type of metric, this churn-off metric, although extended to uh, Markov environments, which, which has been done uh, in, in, in the lit, you know, literature coming out of applied probability. So what I'm going to do is, I, oops, this is jumping the gun here. I keep on using the wrong pointer. Let me try this. So the first line here, the half-life is infinity. So that's as if you know the true model. Okay? And so the parameters here are the ones that we began with. And this, these, these, these are actually fit to data. We, we didn't just make them up. Uh, the mu was uh, 0.4. We normalized phi to be 0, and then we set, and estimated this kappa parameter to be this value. What what mu plus phi over kappa is, is kind of the long-term average growth rate implied by this. Because, you know, remember that the, uh, remember that the, um, the process here has uh, mu feeding through, but it's also got this uh, process for the macro growth rate. The phi being e equal to zero says that growth rate process would mean zero, it turns out. Um, and, and so the long-term mean, the, the, uh, the overall mean for the macro growth is the same as the original specification of mu. But as I change phi, it's, 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 that's, I, you know, this other term is going to come into play. And changing phi means I add a, a, a constant term to the, uh, to, the, to the growth rate process, and that's going to affect the long run, uh, mean, long run growth rate. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to start picking different half-lives. These are half-lives of these type 1 and type 2 error probabilities. And, and, and that's, uh, so a half-life of infinity is a commitment to, it's just a commitment to, uh, to the original model. A half-life of 120 says is, is, is I introduce a little bit of robustness. Uh, I've got a smaller set of models which I'm entertaining. And then I use the decision problem to figure out what the worst case model is here. And so doing, this, I endogenously determine which is the model that, 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 that's feared by the investor in this calculation is I make mu less from 0.46 to 0.42, I, I potentially reduce the amount of o, uh, um, average growth coming from the consumption dynamics. I introduce a negative phi here, so I a actually add a, a mean term into the uh, X process, and then I make it more persistent. Smaller kappas correspond to more persistence because, they, because here we're modeling things in continuous time. So the autoregressive coefficient would be like that we're used to when uh, discrete time series analysis would be the exponential of the negative of this guy. So smaller kappa corresponds to more persistence. The long run mean now gets reduced from 0.465 down to 0.2562. So this is a model. This is the worst case model you give what you produce out of these, the, these robustness concerns, uh, allowing for time varying parameters and other forms of misspecification. Uh, you implement the robustness by picking these guys out here. And this is all determined endogenously by the choice problem. Mu's reduced, fees reduced, kappa's, kappa's reduced. As I reduce the half-life, more and more models, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to start you know, putting more and more models on the, on the, on the table, and I'm going to get more, more and more dr dramatic adjustments here. So I go down to 80 to 40. These parameters just go down more and more. These go down, and, 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 and these go down. So you get more persistence here. You uh, uh, reduce the fee, and the overall long run mean is, is get, gets reduced. Now, these aren't meant to be the beliefs of the agents. These are parameters which you make more cautious in order to implement robust decision making. That's, that, that's kind of a relevant way to think about this stuff. So, and as I said, we, the turn off measure is if we translate it into half lives. You know, how long does it take to cut these uh, mistake probabilities in half? So, so here are the calculations. This, these are the kind of impulse response functions for consumption to the shock now to the um, growth rate. The, uh, to the macro growth rate. Re recall that uh, you know, this is a from, from the parameter from, uh, from the baseline model. Um, so this is growth rate shock. It feeds to the system and then eventually levels out. Uh, as I 
as, as, I, uh, in, uh, as I introduce finite half-lives, uh, say a, a very large half-life, I distort things a little bit. That's the blue line. I get more persistence, and that shows up here. Um, as I reduce the half-life more and more, I crank up the persistence more and more. So, so, th so this is the impact on that, on that, uh, on the, on that uh, autoregressive parameter, basically. And, I, and I'm just picking up more persistence. But I'm also shifting down the uh, overall mean growth rates as well. Now, what comes out of this um, that's all very interesting to us is the following. When you work out the prices now, that would the, the, the counterpart to the risk prices are now these uncertainty prices. They're, 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 they're captured. By, and since I'm distorted the, distorting the autoregressive coefficient, what I'm going to start finding now is I'm going to find uncertainty prices that are going to be larger overall because of this concern about robustness. That's going to make them larger. They're also going to be larger in bad times and good times. That's, there's, that's going to be a source of time variation. Even though I had no stochastic volatility in the original model, there's going to be fluctua new fluctuations coming in, the, in these uncertainty prices. Uh, I, and and uh, so this, this next plot is going to illustrate those. So for these different different choices of uh, of, the, of these half lives, um, I, I'm going to get as, as as I reduce the half life, I'm going to shift up these uncertainty prices more and more. These are the prices for for that you know that shock to the uh, macro growth rate. So um, I'm going to move. So it's going to start off at 0.2. It would be really tiny if I uh, uh, at, at, sh sh at the so-called infinity number. That'd be really tiny. I'm going to I'm going to go to 0.2. 0.3 and all the way out here between 0.4 and 0.5. Once you're in numbers like this, these are really sizable counterparts to sharp ratios coming out of, coming out of financial markets. Now, what are the bands hot here? The bands here are these quartile ranges again. The prices are fluctuating. So here they'd be fluctuating. You have the quartile range goes from here to here to here, and then down here there are you know, just the fluctuations get all you know all uh, uh, even larger. So depending upon you know. Uh, the presumed richness of the data set, we can get, uh, we can get, you know, it's, uh, um, we can get more and more caution showing up here, and we get more and more fluctuations as well. Things are fluctuating to these bands, and they're kind of fluctuating qualitatively in the way we, we we think about financial markets working. They're getting bigger in bad times than good times. So, so kind of what, so what we get out of here is an alternative to a risk price. It's kind of this concern about model misspecification. Uh, you get fluctuations as well. The, 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 these are moving around. In bad times, these prices are, kind of, are going to be bigger than in good times. Uh, so, you know, do, do I, do we read the financial press that's telling us that, oh, well, markets are, look risk averse today, and, 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 and I, in other periods, they're more tranquil, you know, things aren't so risk averse. Well, I want to think about that as uncertainty version. I want to think about coming from, from, from investors not really, you know, very confident in, the, in, in, in their models, and I want to produce that endogenously. And so this is a yeah, this is a way to get at those effects. So my remaining time, um, do we go to twelve or which? Twelve. Okay, so so I still have a few more, I, I still have a few more minutes. Okay, I'm wa I want to think about a little bit. So far, I'm just looking at decentralized security markets and trying to uh, indicate how I can use these methods uncertainty more broadly conceived to get not only bigger, to explain big uncertainty prices in financial markets, but also to get at their fluctuations. I want to now think about policy questions. Um, uncertainty, I believe, has been understated in the discussions of economic policy of a, of a variety of types. And um, there's this distortion, I think, of policy making that uh, at least politicians seem to want to gravitate to economists who can express their opinions with great confidence, even though the, those, those opinions are not necessarily tied very closely to historical evidence. Um, there's been caught, uh, the, the concerns about this, this has been, been expressed in the past, and so let me bring out a couple of quotes here. Um, when, uh, when Hayek won the Nobel Prize in 1974, he shared this with, with, uh, with Myrdal. And Myrdal and Hayek didn't have very much in common, uh, just, uh, just, uh, I guess it was viewed as a balancing act. Hayek wins the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences and produces this rather provocative essay, challenging the sense in which uh, economics is really a science, basically. Um, he says that mathematical models are potentially useful as, uh, as uh, conceptual guides, but not so much as quantitative tools. Um, uh, I've, uh, I share part of what 
highest concerns were. Uh, I'm not one to throw out economic models for quantitative work. But, th but this quote, I think, is really um, quite, inter uh, quite insightful. Even if true scientists should recognize a limit of studying human behavior, as long as the public has expectations, there will be people who pretend to believe that they can do more to meet popular demand than what is really in their power. And this is kind of a concern that, the, that, that, the, that policy makers will gravitate to confident, to uh, excessively confident uh, economists who produce the policy advice, even, per, even when it's not potentially grounded in solid empirical evidence. There's a, a variant of this that comes out of, uh, oops, well, I guess I don't have it. Yeah, so Milton Friedman, when he's talking about monetary policy, kind of had similar, uh, kind of expressed very similar sentiments trying to argue for simple monetary policy rules because of so called long and variable lags. We didn't really understand transmission mechanisms coming out of the economic models. Therefore, we shouldn't like start having elaborate policy recommendations um, until our understanding was more on, on, on more solid grounds. So I, I think these, these, this type of questions, I think, are really, really important. And, and it's valuable to try to produce tools that allow us to think about these much more, uh, much more um, that are kind of usable in, in, in actual policy discussions. Uh, so one possibility is, uh, is we just start using our economic models in more cautious ways. We can go back to this outside the model perspective under which, you know, from outside the model, whenever we give a policymaker a model, just make sure that that, that policymaker has appropriate qualifications, multi maybe multiple models, multiple models with different outcomes and, and looking at robustness across the different model configurations. But there's a different, even more ambitious way to go that, I should, that we've been trying to that kind of scratch the surface on. Suppose we want to go back to kind of dynamic game theory with policymaker game, games between the private sector and the government, Think, thinking of the, the government as a so-called Stackelberg le leader. Um, and now we have uncertainty. Both parts face uncertainty. The policymaker faces face uncertainty. The policymaker doesn't really necessarily have full confidence in models. People inside the models don't have, uh, have full co confidence either. And then we look at their interactions formally as some type of dynamic game. So, so one can envision what one might think of as a robust Ramsey planner. So the Ramsey planner is a stand-in for some benevolent policymaker. And uh, this Ramsey planner now, now, suppose we endow this Ramsey planner with robustness concerns. These concerns could come from the planner. They could also come from the private sector. Uh, um, and these are going to alter the design of what, uh, what are good policies. This gives rise to the policymaker engaging in things like managing or monitoring expectations, and it may also, uh, it may also give rise to uh, caution because of model uncertainty. So I think developing tools that allow us to think about this interplay between uncertainty from the standpoint of the policymaker and from the private sector is a potentially fruitful and powerful way to go forward. Also, if you've got multiple agents on the table here, you know, even even if you go back to the private sector and have different types of populations with different choice problems, um, there's a sense in which this, this apparatus produces um, ex post beliefs that, that, that implement robustness. Once I change the, 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 if people have different decision problems, they're, they're going to slant their models in different ways. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to start looking like ex post belief heterogeneity. Even if I start off with people with the same family of models at the outside or same family of priors, if their decision problems are differ, when the, when the, uh, uh, the probability, the models that have the most, the strongest utility consequences, the most adverse utility consequences will, will be different for different people or different types of people because, because their choice problems are different. This framework, and, you know, lots of people these days are using models with heterogeneous beliefs, but where does that belief heterogeneity come from? Well, this type of apparatus would give you a way to endogenize um, uh, this, the, this, uh, this belief heterogeneity through this computation of worst case models. Thus, such models depend on the decision problem. If decision problems are different, they'll generate ex post heterogeneous uh, uh, beliefs. Um, in fact, one can think of th this as an apparatus to give rise of a so-called models of overconfidence by some agents. Imagine some agents in the, in the economy have a model. They have complete naive conviction to it. Other agents are more cautious. They have a whole family of models, and, and, and they uh, 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 proceed in more cautious ways. Um, the first we can think of as, a, as, a, as an operational white way to get the notion of overconfidence, uh, so, uh, uh, something that people often talk about, but, uh, but, but, but this gives you a way to uh, give content to it. Um, so with that, I think I'm... Uh
think I've about reached what I want to say. Uh, to summarize, 2 percent on uncertainty outside the model and inside the model. There's multiple components to this uncertainty. Risk. Risk is the usual model we think about. You're, you're, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's the usual notion. There's a bunch of random shocks in the future. I know the probability distribution, but I don't know outcomes. Model ambiguity. How much confidence do we place in each of the models that which we want to uh, take under consideration? Perhaps the most challenging one to confront is model misspecification. We write down models. The models aren't quite right. They're potentially wrong. How do we use models that are not perfect in ways that are sensible? Um, from a standpoint of policy analysis, although I, um, let me just suggest that, given the limits of our understanding, that complicated problems, complicated policy problems, may not be dress, may be best addressed by simple solutions. Once we acknowledge, as Friedman would like uh, wanted us to do, and Hayek wanted us to do, limits to our uh, understanding of the underlying environment. So once we go at these more general versions of uncertainty, all the way down to the third one, uh, it, we may well be led to um, uh, uh, embracing more simple, simple solutions, even though the problems themselves are very complicated. This, uh, th this extends all the way to uh, climate change, to financial market oversight, and to a variety of other policy questions. So with that, I think I'll, I will stop. Thank you.